Hi, I'm Kathy Milans, and I am a counselor here in Wilmore, Kentucky. I have Path of Life Ministry, and I'm here today to interview Dr. Kenneth Collins. He is professor of Wesley Studies and Historical Theology at Asbury Seminary. And what we're going to be working on is taking the best of psychology, the best of theology and spirituality, and helping those of us that are out there caring for God's people to integrate those into our healing ministries. And so today we've invited Dr. Collins here to talk with us to look a little bit more at the soul and that how that might help us as we're working with people, God's people, to help them to healing and wholeness. Dr. Collins, we have some questions for you today. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Good. Wesley rarely spoke in his writings or wrote about the care of souls except through his preaching. The direct action of God in the life of a person was given a lot more emphasis than any particular spiritual guidance. Uh, Dr. Collins, what do you think Wesley would say about our soul care movement today? Well, first of all, we have the difference between the 18th century and the 21st century, um, and that will be reflected in language. And so, yes, it is correct that Wesley rarely used that language, um, the care of souls. He only used it a couple of times uh, in his writings, but he also used this language of what is called the cure, the cure of souls. And that basically involved a holistic pastoral approach to, um, to flourishing, to human flourishing. Um, Wesley also uh, used the language of inward religion, inward religion, and that language would be um, significant and would be often found in his writings. And so Wesley gave great attention to what we would call the care of souls today. He gave great attention to that, even though his language is somewhat different. It's somewhat different. Um, and it's not a superficial treatment that Wesley has because uh, he is very knowledgeable of the dimensions of the will in terms of its dispositions, that which it is disposed towards with respect to its loves, its desires, its goals, its ends. And he's always thinking of um, Christian transformation in terms of those realities. So I think um, Wesley would be a very good resource uh, today uh, for uh, this issue of the cure of souls. And I explored that um, in an article a few years back called John Wesley's Typography of the Heart and, and basically laid out some of the uh, issues here. Yeah. Thank you. The words soul and spirit are often used kind of in an interchangeable way. Do you see them as the same or different? And if they're different, then how do you see them as different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been having uh, discussions with people in Wesley studies about this very issue, and I've been talking also to doctoral students who are very helpful because they're on the cutting edge of research. And um, we've been coming to the conclusion that it's helpful to distinguish uh, spirit and soul uh, and can illustrate it in this fashion that all human beings have souls. Uh, we can go back to uh, Aristotle's um, De Anima uh, of the Soul um, and he talks about three dimensions to the soul. The vegetative soul, we would see that in terms of plant life, plants are alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, the sensate soul in terms of the whole animal realm. Uh, animals, of course, having senses, knowledge mediated through the senses. But then Aristotle talks about the rational soul. And this is common. Uh, this is human experience. And indeed, some theologians, like Augustine, for example, uh, explore the image of God, the imago Dei, in terms of the rational soul. Uh, and so soulish life is something that all human beings participate in, but we don't all have the same spirit. Uh, and there's a sense in Wesley's writings 
that the body and soul or the embodied soul is the tabernacle in which the spirit resides. And so there would be a distinguishing of soul from spirit in this respect. Not all people, for example, have the Holy Spirit reigning in their hearts. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, yes, but they all have souls. They all, all human beings have souls. So I think it's helpful to actually uh, distinguish these terms. Thank you for clearing that up for us. Yeah. Now, leading into that, dichotomists kind of argue that people have a body and a soul. But trichotomists argue for a body, a soul, and a spirit. What do you think about this from a scriptural point of view in terms of persons? And then what would that mean for the healing of God's people today? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you can see, Kathy, from my answer to your early question, I'm, I'm sort of leaning to mm -hmm. the trichotomy, uh, the three-fold uh, understanding of body, soul, and spirit. Um, the dichotomy has been heavily criticized, especially by philosophers. Uh, they have worked through that, you know, the old Cartesian body-soul dualism. Mm -hmm. It's been heavily criticized. Um, and there actually is a, another view out there, and indeed we had a conference at Asbury um, a few years back, a few years ago, on this topic, and there were some, interestingly enough, monists, the monist position. True. Um, and uh, uh, to me, the issue becomes, um, can we use the language, the vocabulary of the soul, in order to understand our own selves and our own experiences? Some feel that we have been pushed off that language uh, due to uh, scientific empiricism. And before I came to Asbury, I, I taught philosophy for over a decade. Um, and I do have a background in critical thinking, and so when I look at this issue, um, uh, I look at science in terms of its methodology, uh, and then also what you can know by a particular set of methodologies. And it would seem to me, and again, you know, as someone with this background in philosophy, that, that science as an empirical discipline has nothing to say one way or the other about the existence or non-existence of the soul. It's mm -hmm. not the kind of thing or entity that, that could be explored by science. Right. Given that is the case, then I would argue, uh, as a Christian theologian, that we have the right and the freedom to use this vocabulary if we find it helpful to express uh, our own experience and to understand our own story, our own narrative, uh, in, its, in its many dimensions. And so um, I think this is a very important question, um, and I just hope that people are not reluctant to employ the language of soul, because it can be tremendously helpful. Yes, it can. Yeah. Well, let's take a look for a minute at psychology, because we're really talking about integration here as well, and psychology does mean science of the soul but often the soul is taken out of the science. So what do you think Wesley would say about the ways today that we integrate theology, spirituality, psychology into our healing ministries? One of the things I like about John Wesley is that he's such a balanced thinker. Mm -hmm. So if Wesley were alive today, I would see him studying psychology and then also reading the church fathers and, and you know, culling the spirituality that he's getting from some of the great Christian classics and sort of forging a conversation. There's lots that we can learn from psychology, especially in terms of physiology, behaviorism. There are lots of lessons to learn. But I think we can also learn from the wisdom of the saints, so to speak. Yes. In other words, the great uh, spiritual traditions uh, of, the, of the ecumenical church. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that Wesley really was a pretty integrative type of guy. Yes, uh -huh. precisely. Yes. If Jesus was sitting here today, which he is, but <laughs> if we could actually have him in that chair, yeah. what do you think he, how might he define the soul? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> Jesus does use this language. I'm thinking of Matthew 10, 23. I'm quoting here from the NIV. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Mm -hmm. Rather be afraid of the one, meaning God, who can destroy both soul and body 
in hell. Um, it's rather interesting what Jesus is saying there. He's saying that, that humans can kill the body, but they can't kill the soul. And that says to me that something is continuing beyond death in terms of a human being that is under, uh, whether it live or not, under the prerogatives of God and the freedom of God. And that's interesting to think about that. And there are uh -huh. some biblical theologians today, people like N.T. Wright, who are talking about the ongoingness of, of the soul uh, in, in their works, uh, as well as affirming the resurrection uh, of the body later on. Uh, and so I, I think Jesus acknowledged the, the reality of soul. Well, we thank you so much for coming and being here with us today yes. and sharing some of your ideas that we can take this and actually meld it into the way that we work with people every day. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.